<laughs> Wait a second. Display capture. Display capture. Okay. It's a great tool. Don't don't even like. Okay, it's working. Should be okay. At least recording is here. So. Yeah. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, it doesn't. It doesn't. Wait, wait, wait a second. That's a good comment. Yeah, yeah. It shouldn't be inverted. Um... <laughs> Why is it inverted? Why? It's not inverted here, but it's inverted here. I I have no idea why it's inverted. My God. I have no idea. Here it's fine? No, no, it's fine. Though. Oh, yes. Why is it inverted? Can you turn off? No, 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 no. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Mirror camera. Yes, now it's good. It's working. I'm so happy. Oh, my God. It works. Done. Now it works very well. Now it's not inverted. You're normal. Not inverted. Hello. Welcome, everyone. To a very normal, non-inverted me. Uh, <laughs> to be here. I'm Carl. Um, I'm one of the co-founders of Video Game Insights. Uh, Andres very generously offered to me to talk about myself, so I said, "Yeah, of course." I'm um, going yeah, to talk about like five, ten minutes about Video Game Insights and who we are and what we do, and then I want to talk a little bit about kind of games research as well and everything that uh, it includes. Um, and you know not really related to necessarily video game insights, but just kind of how I think about it. Um, I want to start by the chapter of what the hell is VGI um, and talk about the four people involved here. Um, we're all here today, I think. Yeah, yeah, we're still here. Um, so I'm Carl. I'm originally from Estonia. I moved to UK like 10 years ago now, um, and I started very much not in the games industry. I did strategy consulting for a while, um, working across different industries, including games. And then we had a project where we needed data for uh, uh, the mobile market as well as PC. And mobile is pretty easy. I don't know how involved you are in this, but if you know Sensor Tower or Data AI, they recently became the same company, um, but they're incredibly good at providing everything you need to know about apps and downloads and blah, blah, blah. Um, very expensive, but if you have the money, they do a good job. We were like, cool, let's use them. Let's find whatever the equivalent is for PC. And there was just basically nothing out there. It was like Steam Spy, but even in 2020, when we uh, needed this data, Steam Spy wasn't that good anymore. So I reached out to my friend, Harry. Um, I said, hey, can you scrape the whole Steam for me? Uh, I need it really quickly, like by tonight would be great. Um, I don't think he took it really well, but he did it in the end anyway. Um, and that's how it started. And then we kind of put the data on the internet to see if anyone else wants to use it as well. And they did. And then we started charging a bit for it and people still wanted to use it. And today we are um, four people growing pretty well, growing pretty fast. We provide right now um, everything related to Steam games. So from unit sold to active users to what countries those people come from, how many wish lists do games have. Um, and by the end of the year, we hope to be on PlayStation and Xbox as well and provide that data as well. Um, started very much with the focus of let's make sure that we can provide stuff to indie developers for them to be able to make better decisions, um, as that was kind of the main area where there was nothing out there for them to um, be able to use. Um, oh yeah, and, and in terms of my background, uh, I then also worked at 2K as a director, commercial director for specifically NBA 2K, working on anything from like pricing to pro promotional discounting strategies to where should we spend the marketing money, uh, where should we, um, you know, what the SKU strategy should be, um, 
and kind of somewhat involved in life services elements as well. And I quit beginning of this year, so now I'm full-time with BGA. Now, the stuff that we wanted to answer uh, was pretty much the questions that I had when I worked at 2K or the questions that I heard going around a lot of the times. So we wanted to be able to support anyone from like a marketing manager that wants to understand where should they de like deploy most of the marketing budget, uh, market analysts understanding how, you know, if they underperformed or overperformed versus the expectations, was it because the market's down or up or the genre is in right now or like, are the competitors doing well or not? Um, you know, how if you're a live services game and your retention's crap, is it like how does that compare to your competitors? What's your day one, day eight, day twenty eight retention? That kind of stuff. Um, but also questions that are even before the game's launched, right? It's like what kind of game should I focus on right now? If I don't really know, or I'm not, I don't have a very strong idea about the genres that I want to focus on. What's actually popular right? what captures people's interest um, and what might be popular in you know two three years time when I launch the game um, so a whole bunch of questions that can be answered with data and historically even in really really big publishers and, and um, dev studios on the kind of console and PC side have really been answered by one dude with 20 years of experience based on I think the answer is this and they just don't really look at data. And if you have worked in mobile industries, this is completely different, right? From the very beginning of like, whenever the kind of first really big free to play mobile titles came out, it was all about data. It was all about making sure that whatever your marketing spend is per person fits the lifetime value of the customer, right? And everything was super, super data driven. Um, and now it's kind of started to get more, um, you know, maybe up to date with the console and PC world as well. And people are becoming a little bit more data orientated um, to a large extent, probably because mobile people are kind of moving into console companies and vice versa. And there's a little bit more of kind of that education going on. Um, and that has really helped us to grow over the last uh, few years as well. So I put some metrics here just to show uh, roughly how how we started. We very much started as kind of bootstrapping, doing it as a hobby project. We both had full time jobs when we started doing it nights and weekends, um, and then people started using it. We we're very happy about it, and the growth has continued up to this day. Um, we now have our four hundred fifty paid subscribers, and I guess most importantly, some of those subscribers are pretty like like ridiculously big names that we never expected to be able to serve. Um, I think we had like $19.99 a month uh, service that we offered. And then at some point, Ubisoft signed up for that. And we were like, holy shit, like we're really <laughs> under charging here. We could be judging about 200 times more. Um, so that was really that aha moment for us of like, okay, this is not just the hobby. We can actually make this a business. Um, and that's about as much as I wanted to talk about us. I wanted to spend the rest of the time. And this is a bit where I hope this is a bit more kind of discussional section and we can talk about, like feel free to jump in and ask any questions when and if you have any. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit about games research in general from my experience at 2K, but also um, whilst building BGI and what the main questions are that people have um, that they try to answer with either our service or other services like that. Um, and the one thing that I heard a lot when I started this product, uh, and it, I just, it's not even me reaching out to people. People reached out to me to say, hey, your product sucks because I don't need data. I'm building the game I want to build. I'm like, that's, that's cool. <laughs> I'm not forcing it on you. Um, if you don't you know, want to uh, be able to afford rent or whatever, that's fine. Go do your thing. Um, but I think a lot of the educational side that we try to do, especially on the, in the end, is like just because you use data to make informed decisions, or just because you think about your um, game as a business as well, doesn't mean that you're selling your soul. It doesn't mean that it's not a creative endeavor anymore. Or it doesn't mean that you're replacing creativity with data, right? No one's telling you, like, hey, the biggest top earning game is a survivor 
survival crafting games, so you need to make this game, right? It's like every genre is viable. You just need to then figure out what makes it more viable within that genre. Um, so that being said, uh, I want to talk a little bit about games research and specifically there's seven things that I pointed out here um, that are the kind of main points that I had to deal with at 2K and main points that when people reach out to us, are they're interested in as well. Um, the first big question is market research and market sizing and essentially it comes down to what do people like right now? Like which games, which genres, which subgenres tend to be more popular right now? It really differs by platform. It really differs over time, right? right? Like uh, trends come and go. Um, and the big challenge of that is like what's popular right now might not be popular in three years' time when you launch your game, right? So you kind of have to try and predict it a little bit as well. Um, but the key point around it is to kind of try and avoid the areas that are really overcrowded right now and maybe not there are, there isn't that much demand for those games, right? So like the example I always uh, bring and hopefully I don't offend a lot of people here is like the 2D platformers, right? Which like is basically the first game that anyone ever makes when they get into game development. It's like absolutely fine to make it, but don't expect to make millions with it, right? Even though maybe there are five 2D platformers out there that have made millions. Um, the second point here that I want to talk about is competitive research, which is really a question of, okay, I'm gonna, I've decided I'm making this game, this type of game, um, maybe I should have a look at other type of games like that out there. What are they doing today? How well have they performed? What are they pricing themselves at? Um, what are the features that they have? You know, can I get some inspiration there? What's whatever? It's, what are the Steam reviews for those types of games, right? What do people hate or love about those types of games? So understanding what's out there right now that is kind of like the game I'm building or at least has elements of that game. Release scheduling, when should I release my game? Uh, could be a very data-driven answer there. Pricing and promo analysis, a lot of it is just like, okay, what, you know, is it 9.99, is it 19.99, is it 29.99 that I should price my game, does it matter? Um, and then once I launch, like when do I do my first promo? Is it, should I do 10% or 15 or 25%? And then what is it, what's ha happening afterwards, right? Um, Sales forecasting is kind of just the point of like, what can I reasonably expect to make when I'm launching this game? Just having some kind of idea of that would be probably nice. Um, and then sense checking, like even if you're outsourcing all of the commercial side to a publisher, right? So you were like, you don't want to deal with this. You just want to be a development studio. You probably still want to be at least some level aware of what's going on and what your expectations should be. Um, it happens less and less these days, but there are still publishers out there that are kind of predatory and try to rip you off a little bit, right? Um, so like having some level of commercial awareness is not a bad thing, even if that's not what you want to do most of the time, right? Um, so I wanted to go through each of those things uh, and talk a little bit more detail about it. But if you have any questions or any like relevant commentary or experiences with any of those things, like please feel free to jump in. I'm going to try and give a little bit of a 2K angle on some of those things of as which, well. What's usually lifespan for being popular? Six months or just three years? Or um, if zombie game is popular now, does it mean it will be popular for the next four months? Or? Yeah, it's interesting. It's a good question. I think it really depends on the genre type of game. And more and more we see the market getting a little bit crowded because games stay popular for longer, right? It's like there, uh, I we just released a free to play report actually, where um, something like over half of the play time on Steam right now is spent on free to play games. And within those games, it's like basically four or five games that are the majority of that time, right? It's like CS uh, or Counter Strike 2 is still by far the most played game on Steam and has been since you know, pretty much the beginning of Steam, right? Um, and Dota has been around for over 10 years now, I think. Um, and what else is out there? Like PUBG is like since 2017 has been incredibly popular, doesn't really seem to be fading that much. So there are some types of games and especially these live services games that 
are proving that there is this almost like evergreen type of game that can be around for almost decades and is still popular and they are doing well some of them are doing updates and kind of keeping keeping up with the recent trends but some of them like you know counter-strike is counter-strike like it hasn't really it's not doing any fancy Fortnite stuff or like trying to replicate things that it isn't right um but at the same time you see some game trends like i don't know about zombie shooters specifically but you can see like survival crafting games are very popular right now right but it's i don't know if that's going to stay around for 10 years it feels like it's been around for like maybe five years now like Valheim did really well a couple of years ago power world is like insane this year right so it's like these types of games where there's some kind of co-op element feel and it's not necessarily player versus player but uh like playing together with your friends feels like it's really in right now but how long will it stay in if i start right now and build a game that's launching in three or four years time is it still in it's very hard to kind of predict um so when talking about this market research, um, there's different levels of that, right? One is looking at the genre, subgenre level, like what is doing well right now. If you look at the games that have been launching in the last few years, what type of games are the best selling games? Um, you can use tools like VGI or other tools like Gamalytic is a free one to use. Um, Steam TV even gives some kind of indication as well to then try and filter it down to what's relevant for you, like exclude the really big games and like look at the subsection of what, what's, what's popular within indie category, right? Um, but then once you kind of have looked at that you, and you kind of go levels deeper than that, there is an element of which games actually perform better within that genre or subgenre and what do they do well? So if you have decided that you want to make a, uh, whatever action RPG game, um, you can then look at what the top selling act in the action RPG games are, right? And what makes them spe special? Are there some features that they have or they avoid that like, are kind of more popular or less popular right now? Um, and I think as important to look at is what are, the, what are the unsuccessful games doing that made them unsuccessful, right? Um, especially the ones that had a lot of hype around them that were expected to do really well and then launched and got destroyed, right? Like what, what was it that caused that? Um, and a big driver is obviously bugs and stuff, but if you leave that out, then you think that you can, you know, launch a decent game. Um, where are there some features that were missing that people expected? Where are there some features that were there that were super annoying? Were they like whatever, over monetizing the microtransactions? What is it that really like, made them not succeed to the level that people expected. Um, and I think there's different levels of time that you can put into, right, into this analysis, right? At 2K, we had a team who basically, well, we had several teams that dealt with this, but there's basically probably more than 10 people that just did like market analysis and looking at total addressable market and how many millions of people could you potentially attract with this type of game. And there was so much analysis done on this, I think you can get 80% of the way there with one person spending two days on this and just looking into trends, right? It's like, it, you don't need, it doesn't need to be super time and resource um, like intensive to get a pretty good idea of what's doing well right now. And this is true with everything I'm gonna talk about, by the way. When you then think about competitive research, um, there's a couple of areas that I wanted to talk about. Um, the first one is picking the right competitors to look at. So a lot of the times when I talk to um, publishers who invest in indie games, they say that, yeah, indie games come to us and they have this cool bitch deck and they talk about the game and like whatever theme they go for and show us like some kind of vertical split of it. And then they get to the kind of commercial bits of what they think they can make. And they're like, cool, we're going to make a survival game. And Valheim sold 13 million copies. So we're going to be conservative. We're going to sell 10 million. And you're like, well, no, like this is insane. Um, you pick the, like the most popular game ever. And then you're saying, okay, we're going to do like 80% of that. Um, I think it's like, it's good to see what really good looks like. 
but staying realistic with your expectations and looking at like the median sales within those genres and subgenres and looking at what the, the kind of decent game that did put some effort into marketing and stuff as well. What did they actually achieve realistically? Um, and having it, you know, somewhere between maybe 10 and 30 games that are roughly fitting that kind of criteria or similarity of what game you're designing. Um, again, you can do it with fairly low effort, fairly quickly and get a pretty good idea of what does like incredible success look like, what does failure look like and what's the kind of roughly base assumption that I can make. Um, you can then look at obviously how those games performed. You can also look at how they priced, which sort of already starts to give you an indication of where should I put my game. You can look at their wish list over time and what, how many wishes did they have during uh, launch and how that then correlates to their performance and what should you try and aim for and, you know, where are you today with wish list maybe and what does that mean for your success? Um, and then you can start getting a little bit more into detail and look at some subsection of those games and look at really like doing almost like the proper player insights of like playing this game or looking at the reviews in detail and seeing what are the features that really make this game stand out and do well. Um, the next thing I want you to talk about is reset scheduling. It's a quick one. It doesn't really matter. Um, there has been a lot of research done on this uh, by different publishers and pretty much all of it comes down to it, it, it's not a substantial difference. Like, there, there are very few cases where release window makes or breaks the game. Um, it matters if your game is very specific to some region that you're targeting, right? If your core audience is in China, you probably want to release it at a time when China's awake. Like that kind of like obvious level stuff. Um, but in terms of is it Monday or Thursday or Friday when you release it, it makes very little difference. Um, so I wouldn't spend too much time. The only thing you might want to avoid is like super busy times when a lot of games are being released at the same time or big launches. That being said, I can't remember what the name of the indie game was, but there was a game that basically released on the same week as I think Starfield released. And they did incredibly well because everyone else avoided that slot. So it was basically Starfield and that indie game that launched. And so they ended up doing really well. Um, but yeah, the main takeaway is don't worry too much. If your game's crap, it's gonna not do well anyway. If your game's good and you've done marketing and everything else right, the release window is irrelevant. Um, what am I talking about here? Pricing. Okay, so pricing, uh, yeah, pricing the game is is like a pretty pretty big discussion topic. And again, like at 2K, we spent like months debating that different uh, parts and uh, different um, departments had very different like views on that and marketing was pushing really aggressively that like, we should do you know 49.99 at most we want most people get access to it we could really get an edge if we price it really cheaply and senior exec teams were like why are we only charging 70 we should be charging a hundred <laughs> um, and then there's a whole bunch of people in between right and uh, the, the strategies were very varied. I think for an indie developer, the choice is in some ways slightly easier, right? Your window is really, if you're making a premium game, it starts from 9.99. I wouldn't really go lower than that. So I think there are exceptions to that, but the kind of price elasticity difference between 9.99 and 4.99 or something, like it, it makes very little difference for most people. Um, and goes to like whatever, 29.99 or something, right? If it's like a more premium end of that. And, and then it's really a question of where do you believe your quality lies and where do you, what your, what's your specific strategy of approaching that, right? We have the, what's the game that was launched on the 1st of April? Uh, the, the um, like the one where you, you were a streamer in hell or something, like it was super popular. You're right talking about the Estonian function through that game. Oh, that I know that like, did really well as well. But there was a is that content warning? I think I don't know. Has anyone heard of that? But they did incredibly well because they released it at first of April for free, and then like something like six million people downloaded it, 
And then they priced it at like eight ninety nine or something afterwards, and then another million people bought it like at eight ninety nine. So you know, it's pretty good for I think it's like one person who made it or something. Um, but that was like a great, great strategy because they got so much attention through that. It's again like one of those co op games, and the fact that you know your friend got it for free, and now they want you to get into it as well. And like, I think the whole content was basically your like co op game where you go to hell through a portal or something, and then you stream stuff for YouTube or whatever they called it, and then you get like likes for it, and you die in weird ways. Um, it did really well. It was a very like very easy for it to go viral because it's a silly concept game. It doesn't work with every game, right? But because they had really thought the marketing strategy and launch strategy through, they ended up doing really well through that. Um, we have a um, indie game pricing tool as well that basically you can put in what subgenre your game's in, what kind of um, uh, what kind of um, I think like what kind of theme it is and some other stuff in there. Um, I think it's only available if you go through indie subscription, but let me know if you want to try it out. We'll give you free access to the uh, indie subscription and you can play around on the platform. It's a very quick way to just look at, hey, like they, these are the 200 games that look kind of like the game you're making or in a similar subgenre and a similar kind of indie range. Um, and here's how they price the game. And then you can see, like, okay, if I'm like 50th percentile, it's like 14.99. If I think I'm a bit more premium than that, maybe I go 19.99. Um, my view personally is like it hardly ever hurts to go higher on those prices. Like if you're between 14.99 or 19.99, the people that are willing to pay 14.99 probably are willing to pay 19.99 as well. I don't think it makes that much of a difference. And you can always discount later. And if you start at $19.99, you have more windows to discount, right? It gives you more optionality. I think people often um, tend to undersell themselves. And I think that there are legit arguments to say the opposite can be true. And that content warning game, they prove that pretty much. But uh, I think there are more examples where um, people lose out on money because they too cheaply. Now, talking about discounting, again, it's one of those things where you can spend a lot of time trying to come up with a perfect strategy. But like in essence, it's very easy, right? It's a very ladder system. Your first promo is usually like 20% or so, and then you do like maybe 30, then 3, then you go 40, and then by the end of the life cycle, you're doing like 90% off. Um, most of those promos, like if you look at what, what I've shown here on the line charts below, most of them look kind of like this. So every like jump down, it starts at sixty dollars, and every jump down is like a deeper, deeper, deeper promo. And like people do promos very often because, like especially on Steam, promos are the way to get discoverability. Right? It's it's even like yeah, there's price elasticity, and cheaper price attracts more people. But also, it's a way for your wish list people to get another alert that, hey, this game is on discount. Hey, have you forgotten about us? Hey, we're still here. Buy us. Or if you do really well and if you're popular, this will get you to front page, right? Or it will get you to like the trending page of, hey, these are the hot discounted games right now. Um, so the discoverability element, I would say, is probably more important than uh, the actual impact of being X percent off. Um, that being said, there are differences in how fast people go and how deep they go. Um, if you're a game like Elden Ring or Baldur's Gate 3 did a similar thing, you don't need to discount really for a very long time because people keep buying your game. Um, Baldur's Gate 3 did 10% discount like four months after launch, I think. Um, I talked to some people there and they said uh, they talked to Steam about this and I think they're on consoles as well, right? And everyone from the platform side said, don't do this. This is stupid. 10% makes no impact to sales. Please don't do this. But they basically just said, we don't really want to promote at all right now. We don't want to go on discount. We're just doing this to kind of give something back to the fans. They sold incredibly well. It did so well because people were desperate to get any discount to buy the game. And it was just before Christmas and you're, you know, um, so 
there are cases where very small percentages make a big impact. Generally, um, what did uh, what did Elden Ring do? They did like thirty percent as the first discount, but that was like eight months after launch. I think they did a Christmas discount as well. 20-30% is usually the discount that I see the first game is making. And then it goes down pretty quickly afterwards because, you know, you make something like uh, majority of your sales in the first week or the first month. And then after that, it fades off very quickly. And then your kind of sales will start to basically look like inverse of that. You're basically close to zero. The discount, it jumps up. It goes to zero. The discount, it jumps up. Um, and most of the rest of the revenue you make in the kind of tail end of the lifetime of the game is through promotions. Um, now, how fast and how deep you have to go really depends on, you can see how well your first promotion does, right? If it didn't do that well, maybe you need to go deeper next time. If it did incredibly well, maybe you can kind of stay sane, go a slightly deeper next time. And it's kind of just like seeing the trend of how well they perform. If they start to perform less well, go deeper. Um, the important thing is basically after the first few months, don't miss promos because they will definitely be more useful than uh, than not. Like, don't be afraid to give your game away at cheaper prices because the upside is definitely worth it. Um, for games that are like annual releases, which presumably not that applicable to like indie titles, but uh, the promos start at around 33, 40%. And by eight months in, they're like 90%. Like it's incredibly steep, incredibly quickly um, because they want to just like get as many people in at the tail end because the next game's launching, right? Um, for games that are more dependent on DLCs, Again, you kind of want to go pretty deep, pretty quickly, so you can get as many people in as possible, so you can then start selling the DLCs. Um, question? Yeah. yeah, I would say, would you suggest that the strategies or those curves would change for smaller indie games would be different? Because I, these are all the titles there. Yeah, so I, actually, this is kind of talking about this. I seen very little difference in discounting strategies for small indie like successful indie titles and successful AAA titles i think the discounting strategy is fairly similar discount pretty frequently um and then it's just a question of how quickly do you like what's the kind of how good could you go deep in the discounts and that you'll just have to see based on the first promos i think like you get some feedback and then you're like okay what do i do with the next one um I think the advantage, and this is where I'm getting a little bit, like maybe you guys know more than me, but uh, the Steam algorithm and when it like might give you, put you in a front page or put you in one of the top seller or top promotion right now page, or if you do like a whatever summer sale and you're part of some group of promos there, there are some like cutoff points, I think, after which you're more likely to get into those lists. And I don't really know what those cutoff points are, but there are people much smarter than me that have talked about it quite a lot, which is like Chris Zubkowski. I don't know if you follow him. If not, I've got like the resources list afterwards. He talks a lot about indie game marketing strategies. Um, and the other one is Simon Carlos, uh, who also writes a lot about that kind of stuff. And they, they are very good at knowing like the little hacks that um, Steam has that um, you can kind of take advantage of. Like one of them, I think, is like get to 10 reviews as fast as possible because that then really boosts your sales and visibility on Steam. Before you get to 10 reviews, they tend to like not show your game um, anywhere, basically. Um, yeah, this is just reinforcing the point of like just like do the promos because not doing them is leaving money on the table. There's a Polish um, like kind of publisher investment firm that I talked to recently where their main strategy is to find games that have been launched like four or five, six years ago maybe that have kind of been forgotten about by the developers because they didn't sell that well and then don't do any promos and they basically buy the rights for those games and then they put them on like 80% promo and like do incredibly well through that. Um, and that's their whole like business strategy. They just find those forgotten games and do the right thing in terms of like commercial approach. Um, okay, 
those were all the things that I actually wanted to cover. It's not a really big uh, presentation, but I'm very keen to like talk about any topics that you might have or any other um, areas of this. Um, I can send around this presentation later, I guess, so people have access to uh, some of the key resources as well. I mentioned Simon Carl Carlos and Chris here. Uh, honestly, their blogs are really, really good for that kind of stuff. Um, there is also Super Yours playlist and game dev reports, which are like weekly, monthly something reports that go out so that you should follow just to kind of stay on top with the latest news in the games industry. They're pretty interesting, if nothing else. Um, and in terms of the tools to use, uh, obviously VG Insights is a good one. I fully <laughs> recommend that. Um, Gamalytic is a, is a free tool that also provides pretty good information. Um, they're like the budget version of us. Um, and SteamDB has been around for a while and hopefully everyone's aware of that, but like the amount of data they have is just like slightly more limited. They just scrape Steam and show whatever Steam shows. They don't necessarily estimate sales or estimate wish lists and things like that. So for that, you need to go elsewhere. Um, okay. Questions, thoughts? We do scraping. We also use their open API to get a lot of the data points. So for like followers, price, uh, reviews, that kind of stuff, we get it straight from Steam. So we use the actual numbers. And then in terms of wish lists, units sold, we estimate them. There's a couple of methodologies we use. The one that we kind of more recently have started to implement is we basically track like around a million profiles, uh, player profiles on a daily basis. We see what games are in their library. We see what games they've wishlisted. And then we can use that to kind of estimate the uh, total population and what they do. Um, and there's some pretty cool stuff that we can do with that soon, which is we also see their playtime and how that's evolved over time. We know what countries they're from. So we can start saying things like, hey, for your game, um, or like for this competitive game, 30% of the people who play this game also play that game. And by the way, they bought your game at 50% discount, but generally they buy games at 90% discount. So actually they really must have liked yours or something, or, or the inverse, right? Maybe they generally buy full price games, but they bought yours at 75 percent off. And like, what does that mean? Do they engage with your game less because of that? Are they just kind of like, oh yeah, I got it for free, but they didn't even install it and play it. Um, there's a lot of like, like the data nerd of it inside of me gets really excited from that kind of stuff. So um, there's a lot of that kind of consumer behavior that is really interesting. Like for example, we can now distinguish soon looking at Harry, <laughs> between um, units sold and players, because they're kind of two different things, right? Someone might buy your game, but did they actually install the game and play it? If it's like Boulder Skate and they bought it at $70, probably, because that's pretty dumb if you don't play it then. Um, but if there was a free giveaway of a game, you might have something like 20 million people who have the game in the library, but maybe only 20,000 played it, right? Like it's like, I've got so many games in my Steam library now, now that I haven't played. It's kind of embarrassing, um, which is another interesting topic, actually, of like how spoiled we are for free games these days and how hard it is to justify buying a game at $70 when you have like 100 games on Steam and 100 games on Epic Games that you've claimed and you haven't played. And maybe you've got Xbox Game Pass that you have as well or, or playstation plus subscription or something like you have hundreds of games not to speak of even like the games you've bought over the last 10 years right that now are still pretty good when you bought a game in like 2004 it was kind of unplayable by 2014 but when you bought a game in 2014 it's still pretty playable today right it's like the advancement we've kind of slowed down a little bit about in terms of how quickly games get uh old i guess um so, I mean, that's, that's kind of a sad end to this. Let me try and find a more optimistic uh, <laughs> note. Um, yeah, but uh, I don't know if you have any other questions or anything else. Do you track, uh, you mentioned uh, uh, Epic Store. Do mm -hmm. you even track it? Like, uh, another topic is that 
those free games, they always, you know, just throw at you those really big titles for free. Yeah. What's the point? Like, I already have one. I have stored this giant selection of free games I never played, but I'm like, that's so much money on the table. Yeah. It's, 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 good. it's a good question. No, we don't track Epic Games right now. Um, but we might at some at some point. I think getting to Xbox and PlayStation is more important for us right now. Honestly, I think Epic Games is kind of pointless to track because it doesn't make a difference to anyone. Like, it, like they, I'm surprised because they report the numbers, and they're they reported 2023 numbers. I think they said something like the amount of spend on the platform, including everything, was something like 900 million dollars last year. Um, if you exclude first-party titles, so Fortnite, it's like 300 million. Steam is something like 20 billion. They're like like 5% or less of Steam. And they've been giving away free stuff for years and years and years. And they've gained like 5%. They always like tell you, like, oh, look at our market share. We have 70 million monthly active users. Yeah, they play the free games that they get, but no one's buying anything. Um, so I talked to someone from Epic Games recently, or like an ex- uh, employee of Epic Games, and they said, yeah, but they don't really care about it. They're mostly using it to promote uh, Fortnite. I don't know how true that is. I mean, there's an element of that probably. It's like, I'll give you a free game, and then you pop up the Epic Games launcher, and it's like, hey, have you heard of Fortnite? And you're like, oh, yeah. Um, but I think they were expecting to have much more share by this point, and it just hasn't worked out for them. Um, I don't know how long they will continue free game giveaways it feels like a strategy that just hasn't worked um which is like crazy to me because it tells you so much about the stickiness of the platforms you use right it's uh like we have all these um uh, mobile issues right now of like apple and their 30 percent cuts that they take from the apps and stuff right and epic games is trying to fight them on that um but it's like what, and I think it's like on Android, you could use another store, right? Another store, they don't prevent you from doing that, but no one's using anything else. You're still using the, the um, Play Store or whatever it's called. Um, why did I talk about the sickness of platforms? We talked about Epic Games. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, I don't think they matter. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of <laughs> It's sad, but. It's sad, true. Yeah. So it doesn't make sense to. Post your game on another platform or from Steam or I think you can, but most people tell me that they get like five percent or ten percent of their income from other platforms if if they do well for other platforms. It's it's mostly Steam. Okay. I think Epic also tried the strategy of uh, if you make a game on uh, uh, Unreal Engine, mm -hmm. then you get discounts and uh, more benefits. Yeah, but you can only release the game on the Epic Game Store for yeah. a year. And I've read that even some studios mentioned that they only really made their sales after that year. Mm -hmm. They moved on back to Steam from the yeah. recent Steam. Yeah. That it wasn't actually worth it. Yeah, well that's the thing. You're getting you're getting a discount on ten percent of your total sales potential, right? Which is like even if you get no platform fees on that ten percent, it still doesn't make you make sense to sacrifice the ninety percent that you would get from Steam. So it's it becomes really difficult. So unless they throw a lot of money at you for giving the game away for free, like it becomes very hard. And it was the same at 2K when we talk about um, Xbox Game Pass and PlayStation Plus and stuff. Like they throw so much money at developers or like large publishers, right, to put their games on it. And so the publishers are like, yeah, sure, whatever. But like, does it actually make sense for the platforms to do that? I don't. I don't think so. I don't think the economics is playing out for them. Um, so I think like that gravy train is probably going to end soon. Um, I would have thought it's ended by now, but for some reason they kind of stick to it and maybe there's some kind of, I don't know, this is pure speculation, but that might be more to do with some very senior people in the company kind of not wanting to admit that it's not playing out. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe the platform, uh, subscription stuff is more attractive than what it looks like, but um, anyway, if they give you free money, take it. Well, for platforms, it makes sense because their incentive is to you buying their console. But with Epic and Steam, it's PC. Yeah. So it doesn't matter. You're not buying anything. But how's, how's the console buying incentive working out for Xbox? Not that well, I don't think. 
they're losing That's strength. True. I, I, yeah, true. Sony, yeah, I think, yeah. actually loses money on the PlayStation and they make it back through their studios. Yeah. Um, one question I have is uh, there is kind of this, um, I guess, common knowledge or, or whatever you want to call it that you can estimate the number of uh, sales based off of the number of reviews. Mm -hmm. So I've heard numbers start around like uh, for every uh, review it's 50 sales for some games or 30 yeah. or 20 or something. So is that is there some actual truth to that, or is that kind of like horoscopes for indie developers? No, there is like we use that as one of the methodologies to estimate sales. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it there is truth to it, and actually for more recent games, there is it gets closer and closer to the truth because it tends to hover more around that kind of thirty sales at uh, thirty sales per review ratio. Um, the further you go back, the more volatile it tends to be. But it does depend a lot on like the genre of the game, the price point, is it free to play or not, is it um, MMO or not, or like multiplayer or not, did it do a free giveaway, because when it did, you know, there's probably two million people who claimed it, but they definitely didn't play it and they won't leave a review, so you're, there's a lot of like, it kind of works, but there are exceptions. Um, so. Yeah, for like free to play games, the ratio tends to be much higher because not that many people leave reviews or play it as aggressively. Um, for like a very premium game, it tends to be lower. Some games get review bombed, right? So then like it completely destroys the point of that. So, um, but roughly speaking, it's it's not a bad way to get like a rough idea of what, what's happening, especially if you do it across many games, right? If you try to understand, hey, I've got 30 titles that I use as the kind of competitive set, and I look at the reviews and then multiply everything by 30, you get a pretty good idea of what they're doing. So does that mean that with your tool, somehow I can check what kind of game it's better to do right now? Ish. Um, Ish. <laughs> is that a good answer? Should I say more? Uh, <laughs> So we have like to what genre is popular right now in in like uh, in this scene, you know, like what all those like da data points to check like from where to start. <laughs> Don't <come> on, please. <laughs> <laughs> it should be still learning, right? Uh, are you on our Wi-Fi? Ah, our Wi-Fi is really far, so that's why it's uh, so bad right now. Yeah, that's why. Yeah, the data is <laughs> there. It's not because it's slow. It is, yeah. uh, no, no, really, the rotor is far away in that corner of the of the room, so that's why you, you can't load. But we have a cable there in the corner, but ah, it's too late. <laughs> it's too late, and also, I don't want to try it now in case that it still doesn't work. <laughs> right now. Um, but we have a tool that essentially puts subgenres on a plot that on one axis says, hey, what's the median revenue for games of that subgenre? On and on the other axis it says how many games of that subgenre were released in the last 365 days. Mm -hmm. And it's a really kind of rough way of saying how much supply of those games there are. Um, so you know there's 2D platformers, there was like 2,000 of them released last year. And what's the median revenue of those games for 2D platformers? It's like two thousand dollars or something. And then on the other extreme, you have I think like Forex, uh, Forex games. I think is one, and the other one I think is like survival uh, crafting games that you know are low tens that were released last year, but they make like hundred thousand or something. Do you even have this? Uh, no, thankfully my laptop's too shit. I think. Yeah, great. Okay. <laughs> you so don't have it. Wi no, yeah, yeah, it's the Wi-Fi. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I tried. <laughs> I did my best. <laughs> <laughs> Use my my um, power. Do I have filters on here? Yeah, filters. I think that's what's. Okay. Yeah. So definitely the platform works perfectly for everyone listening. <laughs> um, I'm gonna. Go away from this. <laughs> <laughs> my presentation. Um, but yeah.
but yes, basically you can you can have a pretty rough view of like how popular some subgenres are and um, and how much of those games have been used. The caveat there is like obviously we don't ca capture the complexity of making this game, right? Just because um, you know four X games make more money than two D platformers doesn't mean that it's a better game to make because one takes two years to make, and one takes like two weeks to make, right? So like you have to adjust for that as well. And within um, within uh, each genre, there are games that do really well. There are like literally every subgenre you can think of. There is a game that has done well in there, right? So then it's like just figuring out was that a fluke or did they do something that actually is making that subgenre more popular than it normally would be, for example. Um, yeah, a long a long time ago, I. Uh, Saw so this GDC talk by uh, one developer. And he mentioned a strategy. I don't know how. You, what do you think about that? But the strategy was that so um, he said, "Keep supporting your game. Mm -hmm. You don't just release and let okay. it go. But basically, every Christmas, every special event, you would get an artist or something, add some new skins, some whatever, just yeah, to keep it relevant as much as possible." And he said, "You can still keep." Making some profits, if not a lot, but enough mm -hmm. for uh, for as long as ten years. Yeah, probably. and again, I think it depends a little bit on the type of game, but there is for most games there is a pretty long tail of like revenue trickling in, and it's not a whole lot. Every time you do a promo and maybe you release a little patch and add something to it as well, and it does super low effort like to do it. Um, but it does help and it um, brings more attention to it again. Um, and the kind of good side of that is that you can see how popular your game ends up being as well, right? And is it worth it and try it? And like, did it, did it boost the sales enough to make it worth adding that one extra little thing in there or not? And then if it did, you can continue doing it. If not, stop and focus on the next game. So you can always kind of reprioritize your efforts depending on what feedback you're getting from the game. Um, and it's the same with DLCs as well, right? It's like sometimes, and like Paradox, does, the Paradox is so good at that kind of stuff, right? They have absolutely rinsed me when it comes to spending money on games. Um, but they are very good at being very ruthless at looking at like, okay, how many players do we still have in this game? Should we release a DLC? What should price it as? How do we do that? How do we bring people back with like maybe a free DLC and then do another DLC that's charging? And they now do some kind of subscription thing that obviously I had to get. Um, that again, like it gives you all the hundred DLCs that they have released for that game uh, for just nine ninety nine a month or something. Um, so they are very good at doing that kind of stuff of like reacting to feedback. Like, should we put more effort into this game, or should we put our effort into the next game? And it's all just like a like balance of like, where do I make more of an impact with my time? Uh, I have a question about, um, have you, I guess, done any like research or having any insights on, um, let's say after you release a game, mm -hmm. uh, that first month or two, releasing like another concept update or, or something like that, like what kind of difference that makes as far as being in people's news feeds, seeing, or as one of the recently updated games and that kind of thing. I have not looked into that. It feels to me intuitively like the right thing to do. Because, um, you know, your followers will get an update on Steam on that, right? If you release a new thing. Um, and it just gives you, like, as you say, like you're the kind of recently updated or whatever, you, you're just, you're giving yourself more visibility early on in the game's life cycle where it still makes a bigger impact. Like doing the same thing a year later versus doing it very early on, it's, it, it, it's a very big difference. I think in general, the first well, first week especially, right? But first month of the game is so, so, so critical. And the more you can do to like make sure that people stay engaged or get in front of their mind and uh, make sure that they kind of stay engaged with it to make sure that 
if there's any like co-op elements of that or any reason for them to recommend your game to their friends that like that you know all their attention is on that the more you can remind them of your game the better um and like content releases are a great way to do that thing. and again i don't think any of those things will like suddenly make or break the game like it's not gonna if, you, if the launch didn't go well the next content update is not gonna suddenly well very unlikely that it's gonna make a substantial difference but it will like help to boost it um and it can be pretty low effort versus the, the upside okay okay that's that's enough information for today <laughs> That fry everyone's brains. Yeah, yeah that's great. That is great. Now, if if I would want to fry everyone's brains, we could uh, discuss the the Fortnite success. Not Fortnite, but uh, this uh, sorry Roblox. You know, yeah. Roblox and doing maps on Roblox and selling games in Roblox, and that's another market. And uh, it's it's totally like another world than uh, Fortnite creator, you know, to create your maps in Fortnite and this new wave of games that are in games, <laughs> game in the game, and new studios emerging doing games in the games, and the whole studio is only doing maps in in the Roblox. So it's like it's I just have thoughts on that. it's a lot. <laughs> it's like my God, that's a lot. That's that is a lot. Okay, but one point on that, because you, you brought it up, is yes. we all are super angry about 30% cuts that uh, Apple takes and Steam takes and whatever. Fortnite takes, what, 70, 80%? <laughs> yeah. <of that>? yeah. <laughs> like, what the hell? <laughs> what are we talking about? How can you make a sustainable business out of that? I don't know. Like right now, maybe, because they give you a lot of support and free marketing and stuff, but how is that long-term kind of sustain? I don't like that. That one point is like, um... it, I think it's like a, in Warcraft 3, I remember we uh, there was like a modding scene and there were a lot of custom maps, like tower mm -hmm. defense maps and everything. And people just made it for free because it was a lot of fun. And yeah. that's how we got Dota in the end. Yeah. But here they kind of want to artificially create that, you know, mm -hmm. that that's like around the game like this cloud of activity happening but then they're like we will give you money for that to kind of make it even bigger than it is yeah so yeah i don't know it depends on how much marketing support comes with that it could make sense but i don't know how sustainable it is it's that that scares me if someone takes that kind of share just imagine that in five years we will be all making games in games. Like there will be Roblox marketplace, Fortnite marketplace, and most of the games will be released inside of Roblox. Yeah. <laughs> wow. That yeah. would be interesting. Try. Where do you want to make games for? Oh my god. And then we'll have AI who makes those games for us, actually. Yeah. yeah. You will just launch like you go to the uh, Roblox marketplace. <laughs> then, like you just write, okay, they want to play Sonic in the Mario World, and uh -huh. just you know, five seconds, game is generated. <laughs> that's all. And, like, and that's your game for today. And you play it. Yeah. Soon. Soon. <laughs> <laughs> and you play in cryptocurrency. You pay in cryptocurrency. Yeah. Uh, minutes played. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, that's good. I mean, I could play the game for you, so you watch your own. You plan, there's AI commentary there. Yeah. You know? yeah. yeah. Wow, and your AI girlfriend is watching. You. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we have to finish because Sam is leaving. That means that's the end. The future is, <laughs> the future is bright, is what we're saying. Yes. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.